We live in a time in which the role of social sciences and humanities is changing and their significance is drastically disputed. The reasons for this are numerous. There have been inevitable changes in the structure of society itself and therefore is the very meaning of the term society. Globalization has elevated on its own pedestal profit and everything related to it and is evaluating everything by profit and its size or by its absence. In contemporary society, there is obviously a decrease, uh, decrease in the need for scientific knowledge of the social sciences and humanities and their interpretative role. Apparently, the time has arrived in which, as Goethe uh, <coughs> presaged, everyone wants to be someone, but nobody wants to grow spiritually. Social circumstances and above all, radical changes in the value system contributed notably to the decline of the significance of social sciences and humanities in contemporary society, both in terms of having and being. Acceptance of the principles of market economy in scientific creation makes scientific institutes and universities a kind of enterprises with a task not only to make revenue but also to make profit. The social sciences and humanities are asked to give quick results and mainly short-term projects are imposed on them with the only aim to perceive the present. The neoliberal concept of society and therefore the mercantile attitude of the same towards science in line with the ideology of globalism as the ideology of profit evidently is far more <coughs> suitable for natural sciences whose results are more tangible than the results of social sciences and humanities. The problem of social sciences and humanities lies largely in the fact that their contribution to the creation of profits is not always directly visible and therefore it can be not easily measured. Actually, social sciences and humanities have never had the kind of success in terms of profit that natural sciences have obtained and it's hard to believe that they will ever have. However, if natural sciences are the only right means for man <coughs> to manage the nature and the challenges of technology, social sciences in humanities are intelligent means of <coughs> uh, maneuvering the conditions of man's life and society in the best possible way, which makes the problem of their profitlessness less important. The social sciences and humanities are oriented towards the establishment of universal truth about man and society, about human behavior and every place and time, and about the way society and the world are <coughs> functioning. They stimulate the development of critical thinking and creativity. Their role has always been and remains as objective scientific understanding proper <coughs> apprehension and the appropriate explanation of the behavior and the thinking of the human being and also of the causes, development and consequences of different social phenomena in an increasingly complex world. Their purpose is not only to clarify various individual and social problems, but also the risks and possibilities that stands in front of us as evil that obstructs the way to our good. Social sciences and humanities for more important social function is to offer the best solutions to social problems and all together to improve the development of the entire society on the basis of developed reflective analysis primarily from the adequate institutions. However, they will never have the absolute power of predictions as natural science have, 
Since the society and men uh, as their objects of re research are relatively unstable due to the constant and unpredictable dynamics inside themselves <coughs> on te contextuality, but still they cannot and should not give up predictions as their task because the predictions with a high degree of probability can certainly be of the great use also. Apart from the old chronic troubles of social sciences and humanities which question the ability of their scientific basis due to the lack of absolute objectivity and impossibility of predictions with high accuracy, social sciences and humanities are now encountering other less mentioned but not less important problems. One big problem usually <coughs> not talked about much is the fact that social sciences and humanities have gradually started to take a vigilant uh, position so they have been sending for a long time not only warnings about the malfunction and insufficiency of the some social relation but also criticism of society which practically means the authorities. Therefore, they appear as an informal and <coughs> concealed but powerful corrective political factor and a para-ideological competition for every authorities which has been not always been received well in the practical politics area and which also causes certain consequences for the status of social sciences and humanities. There is no doubt about the contribution of social sciences to the self-understanding of man and society, but not all, and especially not <coughs> the richest and most powerful, want an individual to be conscious and educated. Instead, they want him to be sufficiently educated to be able to perform certain work tasks and deliver to, uh, the planned profits. However, the social role of social sciences and humanities is still essentially <coughs> unchanged. What changed are the social issues that needed to be clarified and the speed at which this should be done. Today, these issues include migration, terrorism, or the task between, on the link between economic growth and the climate change. Tomorrow the issues will be different. Certain changes in the role of social and humanistic sciences in the near future are inevitable due to the ever increasing speed of the social life and this will be manifested in their increasing uh, move towards uh, predication and prevention but without abandoning the explanation of the past and the present and offering the solutions for the present problem. This is not the beginning of their end in the question because by maintaining the existing and, uh, and by adding the new functions, the social role of social sciences and humanities is not decreasing. On the contrary, it is increasing. It is very important that this is recognized and adequately <coughs> evaluated. And in the end, I like to conclude with several words. <coughs> Not only the importance of social sciences and especially humanities, but ultimately their survival will depend on their ability to quickly explain new social challenges, determine their causes and paths of development and even faster give the best solutions for these challenges. Those social sciences and humanities that can prove themselves directly uh, useful will certainly not only survive, but will also improve their role significantly. The importance of social sciences and humanities will grow proportionally in their ability to free themselves from the make mercantilism imposed upon them in modern times which will not be easy and will represent a struggle for freedom and independence of scientific creation. And finally, one reality, agreement and cooperation inside the academic community, which means between all the sciences, will always be achieved 
easier than the agreement with politicians. There are those who, for the reasons of misunderstanding, could make major mistakes at the expense of the development of social sciences and humanities from which these sciences would not be able to recover for long, which would consequently lead to various forms of society's decline in general. Thank you very much. The next speaker is, I propose first to hear all of us, and after that have all questions together. Maybe it will be better. Uh, the next speaker uh, is Mr. Carlos Alvaro Pereira. But, but I strongly suggest to, to have first the video by Nora Bateson. What kind of ecology is our education system within? And what does our education system teach us about ecology? It, it isn't as though our students are ever outside of the process of learning how to be in relationship with their worlds. And so I think the question for future education is really much more about what kind of context does education offer for them to learn to be in their world in a less destructive, more creative, more vital way. Um, my interest right now is, is about uh, looking at what are the meta messages that students are getting in the classroom. What are they learning, not only about, say, algebra, as you're sitting in algebra class, but what is being taught in the classroom itself about how to be within the culture that values algebra and values those standards of relationship with authority, with each other, with developing character and identity, how to be the good kid, how to be the funny kid, how to be the bad kid, how to be the smart kid. Because every organism clearly has to respond to the context that it lives within in order to survive. And so every student is also doing that at all times. Every Every little tiny mouse that pokes its head out of a hole has to look around and suss out the context. And to think for one moment that in the classroom students are just learning algebra and that the problem is at the level of curriculum, I think is an underestimation of actually the kind of transformation that we need to see in the education system itself in order to produce a different kind of understanding. For me, that understanding is about the interdependencies of life. When you look at an ecological environment, all of these organisms are in interaction. They're in interdependency. And if you were to ask, where is the forest? Is the forest in the trees? Is it in the grass? Is it in the soil? Is it in the water? Is it in the birds? Well, of course, it's in the relationship between all of those things. And by the same token, students that are in an education system are learning to be in relationship to their world. They're learning what does it mean to be successful? What do I need to know what kind of information? How do I use language? How do I use identity to participate in the world that I'm in? And so to back up and ask that question then, what is the ecology that education systems are taking place in? 
And that's an ecology of other institutions and cultural pressures, cultural pullings, cultural shapings of what the education system actually is. So is it the education system we have to change? Or is it the, the way in which it's being shaped by the world around it? Um, what can we give in that space for children, for students of any age actually, to begin to develop their innate and, and onboard natural processes of perceiving relationship and complexity, which you have to do. The great paradox here is that in order to succeed in algebra class, you have to be able to perceive the necessary relational interdependencies within the culture and the structure of the class and the other students and the issues of hierarchy and so on and so forth to understand how to participate in a world in which that algebra class is valued is is a description of students' innate ability to perceive complexity and respond to it. Mm. It's just a matter of which complexity, which set of relationships, what are the meta messages? So I'm interested at this point in how that set of meta messaging could be shifted. What, what are the conditions in which education itself is taking place? And what are the meta messages around that? How do we move those? What does it look like to create a context that values the context of the natural world and the interdependencies we live within? So that it's not like we've got to learn these pieces over here learn to fragment and then defragment and then participate in a siloed world and give 5% of your profits to the, maybe the interdependencies of our world have some value. But that of course is, is not actually going to cut the need for the change, both at a societal level, at an individual level, and certainly in the level of the humanity the question for humanity right now and how to go forward. How do we live differently? And of course, education is at the very core of that. The International Bateson Institute is putting together a new research project that is addressing uh, a way to describe and provide the necessary evidence and research around how very small children actually perceive and can describe and work with complexity at levels that have previously been thought of to be quite abstract and only available to high-level uh, academics and other intellectual people, which of, of course is silly. Um, little children have to perceive complexity and relational process, and in fact, they can describe and work with it very well. So our new research project is really about what kind of classrooms, what kind of interaction with uh, adults uh, provide the sort of conditions in which there is already existing understanding and, and capacity for working with complexity can be nourished. Um, now the great irony here is that uh, as grown-ups we haven't been given that opportunity. So in a sense uh, the little, little children, three and four years old, are better at complexity than we are. If you're interested in getting involved with this project uh, please contact the Bateson Institute. Thanks.
was re recalled the speech of Nora Batterson, president of International Batterson Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. And now uh, the next is <coughs> member of Roma Club, Carlos Alvarez Pereira, president of Inexis Foundation of Institute in Madrid, Spain. Please. So Floor I is will yours. use a presentation. Uh, just, well, just, just wanted to say, if you are interested in the research project that Nora was mentioning about uh, the, how education can promote complex systems thinking, which is natural in kids, uh, you can talk already to me. You don't have to to contact her directly and we work together. So. Uh, please uh, tell me, and, and we will, and I, I will involve you in the, the part two. You already suffered the part one in the plenary session, so now <laughs> let's go to part two, which is. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't. Did I? No, no, this is part two. Sorry. Yeah, yeah no, that's that's the one. I I didn't change the title. Sorry, but it's the good one. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, the good one. I didn't change the title, sorry. <laughs> so, which is not the, the answers uh, to the questions. Eh? Uh, it's about more questions, but also some of the things we are doing, also with, uh, with Nora, uh, not to give answers, but to try, uh, not to give solutions, but to try to work on some of the ideas I, I provoke to you with in the in the plenary session. So does this work? Uh, I'm not sure. So I finished the, the part one in the plenary with this, with this slide. You know that we have to stop. Stop suffering. Stop suffering. <laughs> Start enjoying life, you know. Stop suffering about the fact that um, complexity of life is overwhelming our usual mental frameworks, the rationalistic ones, the mechanistic ones. That is not a problem. That is a chance, you know. Complexity, over time I'm getting to the point where I, I stop talking about complex systems and I simply say life or living systems, you know. Um, because life is beyond any kind of, uh, as Ilya Prigozhin said, uh, any kind of formal language-based description that we can use. It's just to recall that we have been using, I mean, as I said, physics, developed this paradigm of knowledge and it worked pretty well in that it has been extremely effective in uh, enabling us to have uh, many kinds of sophisticated technologies. I am an aerospace engineer and uh, we used uh, this paradigm of knowledge to develop planes. We, the plane who brought me here to Belgrade, that's fantastic, okay, but uh, it's not, not enough, far from enough, to describe living systems and the evolution of living systems. For that, we need new paradigms of knowledge. Um, and this is about complexity, this is about having holistic views. It is about putting, as Nora, she made that point in her video, putting interdependencies at the core, which is not the usual way we think. We used to think in the way I put the drawings in the, in the previous session, you know, uh, identifying entities that we suppose are autonomous or independent. We think first about those entities. We should think first about the relationships between the entities because the relationships are more important than the entities themselves. You know. And this is this new paradigm. I mean, it is new, not new complexity thinking is uh, an area of thinking which has been developed for many decades now. Uh, more, or less, more or less half, the second half of the 20th century. So some of the insights come from 70, 80 years ago. 
And, um, but we are still struggling with trying to make this uh, better approach in many disciplines, in particularly in, in, in social sciences. So trying to follow the example of physics, which has developed new paradigms for its own purposes, why don't we use that? You know? So some sparks in the dark, you know, because it may be overwhelming. Many times when I talk about complexity, people run away. Um, saying that something is complex is like the first step to an excuse to say, oh, we cannot do anything. If it is complex, we cannot intervene, we cannot know, we, it's beyond our understanding. So it can be, if we take it that way, and not complexity as the foundation of life, it can be frustrating. This is why I say, well, do we have sparks in the dark? One of them, the Club of Rome was, is, w is known for having produced the, the report, No Limits to Growth, uh, The Limits to Growth, sorry, the limits to growth in 1972, many less people know uh, of this report. No limits to learning. I think this is a key concept produced at the time by three scholars from the three worlds which existed, you know, from Romania, the US, and Algeria, and uh, with a very strong message. No limits to learning. So let's practice that, you know. And uh, myself, I've written about what I call the society of living. I will not explain that in this, in this uh, conference uh, paper on that published by the by, in um, in the journal of uh, of the of the WAS about what could be the characteristics of a society in which we would practice um, much more intensely than we do learning in a way compatible with life, compatible with the biosphere. And these are some of the sparks on the uh, in the dark I used. But there is one main issue, which is mutual learning. And this is where we go back to the foundations of cybernetics, as, as developed by Gregory Bateson, the father of Nora, uh, Norbert Wiener, and others. Cybernetics was not about building computers. Now, if we say cybernetics, we make the equivalence to computer science and, and what we know as digital technology. Cybernetics was about understanding better the real life systems. And in particular, that all of them have feedback loops. You know? and the, the point of the feedback loop may, may, may look secondary, it's absolutely essential. And climate, climate, change, climate change is a gigantic feedback loop that is slapping us in our faces. You know? And it's not that we didn't know. Problem of that is we, could, we can say, well, we didn't know climate change would come. We were ignorant. No, it's different. Our mental frameworks made that we didn't care, which is completely different. If you see fossil fuels burning, you might guess very easily that there is something bad coming out of that, you know? I mean, it's not so nice, you know, to see fossil fuels burning. We didn't care about the consequences of, of that. More or less at the same time, by the way, that we developed solar energy. I don't know if you know that the first solar machine was developed in the middle of 19th century. We could have avoided the whole mess by developing solar energy instead, instead of fossil fuels. But anyway, uh, so the point that Noah makes is that we need to develop what she calls symathesis uh, contexts of mutual learning because complex systems do not change because as an external observers, we are in a position to say to understand how they behave and we, we, will, we will do fine tuning. We will, you know, we will modify the parameters so that they change in the direction we want that will not happen that way. Complex systems change by learning, learning new things in new contexts. So the question is quite different. The question is, how do we engage into mutual learning in a way that consciously, I mean, we have the intention to make global systems and human systems move uh, from the course we are in, which is a course to disaster. How do we create those conditions for mutual learning to happen?
and she developed um, a concept she called warm data, which is about, uh, it's a provocation in itself, it's in contracts with big data, a format, <laughs> which is the big, da big uh, sorry, warm data labs, which is about how do we engage into people into dialogues, which to avoid uh, silos, to avoid staying in the usual mental frameworks, and to have richer dialogues which lead to new experiencing complexity, but also to new ideas about how to deal with them. And that's what she has been doing now for uh, three years. And more recently, we inaugurated this concept of people need people, which is a warm data lab format applied to the issue of, uh, of survival, survival of humanity. You know, we are all involved in one way or another in, in patterns of collapse. How can we build dialogues to build something different, to find out ways out of that collapse? On my own, I am very much involved personally in the point of how do we reframe science, technology, and innovation to address the societal challenges we <coughs> really face, and in particular this 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 big challenge of how do we ensure that we get well-being, human well-being compatible with the biosphere. And nobody has done that yet. And this means very different things in different places. In, in, in Africa, where I, come fr I came from Africa <laughs> recently, or in India or elsewhere, it certainly means, uh, I mean, you have, we have to to hear the aspiration to higher levels of well-being, uh, how can we do that? How can they do that without increasing, uh, mm, not much at least, their footprint? How can we decrease dramatically our footprint um, uh, without losing uh, levels of well-being? Well, obviously by redefining what we understand by well-being. And in particular, I think that the processes of innovation, technology and innovation, have to be looked at. The ways they are framed today, and Anne Snick will also talk about this uh, later or tomorrow, I don't know, uh, tomorrow. Uh, the ways they are framed today, they do not contribute, I mean, only marginally. They, Science and technology only marginally contribute to address our One challenges. More. So, in particular, we I am involved in a project in a European project called Siri, where we are working with three regions in different places in Europe, in Catalonia, in Austria, and Norway, to work out these kind of schemes of more circular schemes with communities, and for certain goals. One one case they have chosen zero waste radical circular economy. In other cases, they have chosen decarbonization. And the third one, nowhere has chosen to deal sustainably with their natural resources. How can this kind of complexity thinking be brought in practice? So this is not at all a theoretical uh, exercise, although it is based on a lot of theoretical knowledge, in practice to uh, provide tools to, for dialogues and dialogues for processes and processes to lead to this. And that's pretty much it. Um, I said before we are gridlocked at high speed. The, gridlock, the, the gridlocks are not solved in the same plane where they are created. So we have to move uh, between two options. The, I would say the good one and the easy one. Unfortunately, the easy one is, is leads us to collapse. If we continue, the easy one is to continue thinking the same way we think. That leads us to collapse. So let's say the good one, which requires us to change our mind. And just for information, the Club of Rome is being very active in this type of thinking, of discussions, uh, in collaboration with the World Academy of Art and Science. I'm coordinating, if you are interested also, that I'm coordinating in the club I mean, at the same time, I, I'm fellow of the was in both. I'm coordinating this initiative that we call Emerging New Civilizations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos, for a very for excellent speech. Uh, and the next speaker is.
Tatjana Marković, Academy of Professional Business Studies, Belgrade, Serbia. Please. Thank you. Well, I, as I was coming here today, I was tempted to introduce myself using a battle metaphor and telling you that I'm coming from a battlefield from the trenches and front lines of education. <laughs> but in order to practice what I preach, I've decided to say that I come from the playing field, from the arena of language education. And I've been teaching English for professional purposes in higher education for, for several decades now. My topic is, yeah, my topic is light. Uh, well, today and yesterday, many very pressing and alarming questions were raised, and I'm not presuming that I have any of the answers to these questions, but as I work in, uh, as I already said, as I work in the field, I have some practical ideas, and I need to deal and cope with students and education and learning needs all the time. And Perhaps it would be easier for me if I stand up. Okay. Now, I may be saying many, many common things, but I need to introduce the setting, the field that we are living in. And we all know that it has been designated many different names, the era, the times, like the conceptual age, uh, the innovation age, knowledge age, age of complexity. Thank you age of complexity, it's been called uh, the risk society and some of these names are rosy and promising but some are a bit unsettling and some, some are downright gloomy. <laughs> and yeah, and it seems that we're living in times that are ever more risky and challenging and complex. And what they, tells, uh, that what they tell us is that in order to thrive or maybe just even in survive in these times, we need superpowers. Like we need uh, to have such an intricate web of soft and hard skills, cognitive, affective, social, ethical. Uh, we need to be risk takers, leaders. We need to be flexible, resilient, collaborative, to name just, just a few. But I'm an optimist. Maybe I'm a romantic idealist. So what I also see in the field is that we have a new hero, we have a new protagonist and a new player on the learning field who has also been given many different names, the digital native, the Gen Z, uh, the net gen, and I think one uh, expression is very aptly and witty coined and that is the homo sapiens. In the picture you see some of my, my real students, so um, the homo sapiens was born with a mouse in his hand, so he's, he's a game player. He's a very efficient navigator in the world of networked information. He's also an experimenter and player in, in the virtual worlds. He's a high-speed thinker, a multitasker, and, and he zaps. That's how the expression came into being. A Dutch professor coined the expression. He constructs meaningful knowledge out of uh, these continued sources of information. Now, this kind of player is also a self-directed learner with an exploratory learning style. And this kind of learner, the new generation, he has e expectations of what he wants his learning experiences to be like. So, the, the homo sapiens wants <coughs> his learning environment to be uh, interactive, to be customized and personalized, to be collaborative, authentic, and meaningful, and at the same time, um, enjoyful, entertaining, and playful. So it is obvious that the global learning landscape is changing, and we really need to play to the beat. We need to retune the instruments of, of education. So it's like no more sage on the stage, no more kill and drill, no more even sage on the screen. We need to become architects of learning experiences. We need to become game designers and, and game masters. So when I was first confronted with the new generations coming, I needed to make changes in the way, in the way I teach. I, I needed to play to the beat. So I was thinking, where do I find inspiration for moving on? And where I found it was in the field of play. Because 
play is something that is really universal and primordial, not only for humans, but even, even in animals. It is omnipresent and omnipotent. For Schiller, it was an ultimate expression of human spirit for Hausinga, a person's natural state. And apart from its numerous biological, psychological, aesthetic, and other functions, play has also always been recognized as a very powerful mediator for learning and passing over traditions and social heredity from generation to generation. Now, play is a very uh, fuzzy and an ambiguous concept, and there are so many uh, fine and thin lines between play, game, playfulness, and gamefulness. So I would like to say that I advocate play at all levels as, as, an, as an approach, as a method, as a technique. I would like to advocate play as a mindset, not opposed to seriousness, but opposed to rigidity, to narrow-mindedness, and for drudgery. And out of uh, the many kinds of play that there are, I use uh, an analog, let's call it wrongly, but a classroom uh, epistemic social simulation game, because I think it, it somehow fits in this new, uh, the new paradigm of education and it fulfills all the many roles that we expect of learning and teaching today, because in this kind of uh, in this kind of game, students are immersed in, in a micro world representing some social, economic, or any other complex organizational system. In my case, I use the corporate metaphor, the company simulation, but it could be an island, a hospital, a hostage situation. Now, students are immersed in this world. They act out a defined role in a certain scenario and they experience the feelings and concerns of this particular role. Playing in this kind of simulation, they navigate and explore a complex web of interactions and transactions among themselves, fulfilling tasks and solving problems. And they somehow, they create a learning community and at the same time, they uh, gain deeper insights into the principles and relations of this world. Now, although it sounds just like a game or just like play, there is very serious theory behind this, and uh, it goes, it goes a long way, it goes a long way back. The point of learning of this type of learning is that it happens in Huizinga's magic circle. The magic circle is the safe and sacred space devoted to play and devoted to fun and exploration, and. In this kind of circle, people take risks and grow. So students are safe from any self-consciousness, fear of being humiliated. They're free to experiment with new roles and identities, with skills and approaches, with uh, different ways of seeing things. Uh, they can also explore unknown and new environments. Now, this is all in line theory behind it is the socio-cultural theory, it's the Vygotskian tradition, because in the complex web of interactions and transactions, they create a zone of proximal development. It's a space of generativity where, by means of collaborative dialogue, interactions, support, they uh, learning and development emerges. So it's not that it's any kind of transmission or reproduction, it's co-creation and it's, uh, it's a construction of, of, a learning, of a learning environment. Now there are many benef benefits to using this type of learning because we can create learning experiences that are very close to the way digital natives think and act. They're playful, they're explorative, they lead to flow, the state of optimal experience. We can integrate many different competencies and skills. So in my case, it's not just learning the English language, but they can also learn about content subjects. It could be business or in certain cases, for instance, IT. It fulfills the psychological needs for competence, autonomy, and connectedness. It's a social, social kind of learning. But of course, there are challenges too. The challenge is, of course, how to balance fun, 
fun and learning. How, how not, to, on the one hand, how not to end with chocolate covered broccoli, on the other hand, yeah, how not to make it just a playful experience. And that, that is why debriefing and reflection are integrated into this type of learning. And where I see, not the biggest problem, but the biggest challenge, it is developing the learning analytics for this type of learning. Because assessment and evaluation are very difficult in immersive environments. We have a combination of skills in a very uh, cross-curricular type of learning and it's very difficult to extract and measure at the concrete skills and knowledge that emerge from this. Uh, the effects may be delayed, they're not always immediate. For some, for some of these skills to, to emerge, we need months or maybe even years. But on the other hand, they're so more much useful and they're so more related to real life that I think th this path is worth developing and probably the metrics will be easier, easier in the future. And for an end, I really do believe, and to make a connection with the topic of our, uh, of our panel, which is fostering creative thinking and innovation, play is believed to be a driver of creativity. Play, in play, we break the rules, the patterns, we combine things and ideas in novel, in novel ways. Uh, play is said <coughs> to be a result of evolution and I really do believe it is the key to our future survival through its development of flexibility, variability, uh, new approaches to the world. And in education, I do believe it is the royal road to an ecological, holistic and humanistic approach to learning. And for the end, uh, these are again my students and uh, how they reacted uh, how they react to playing this this game and for me it, it is most important that they felt good and even the timid ma ones the, the ones that are maybe could be disruptive they all get engaged because they learn in a sheltered in a sheltered environment and they feel as one student said they feel important which is which is really very much significant in in those years and times thank you very much thank you very much <laughs> Thank you, Tatiana, for excellent speech. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Professor Goran Pitic from the Faculty of Economics, Finance and Administration, University Metropolitan, Belgrade. Thank you, Professor. <coughs> uh, le let me maybe, uh, instead of um, starting with my um, presentation, let me just maybe uh, make a reflection on the previous, uh, maybe asking the questions that I guess uh, this is the place to ask the questions and to, to try to give some thoughts on that. Uh, first one, I, I very much like the, the Nora's notion of dependency and this interrelationship, and uh, this is probably one of the things that we are trying to find out how to put in our curriculums, how to transfer this thing and put them into the real life. And I think that's really maybe the subject that we have to talk about. Um, the second one of Tatiana, um, uh, definitely play is the best method. There is no doubt the kids are playing and that's the way how they start their lives. It's the question, how do we continue to play once we are a bit older? And I think um, your, your example is uh, really fantastic because obviously you are getting the sources from your own experience. But if you, we would dig a bit more about what are the real problems under beneath, why we are not playing, we would come to a number of factors coming to the traditionalists uh, in the system, coming to the culture, coming to the uh, um, a, a number of things that are, I would say, much more deep-rooted. But we should uh, stream towards playing, definitely. Um, let, let me, let me, let me uh, try to structure my uh, contribution today in, in, in four ways, trying, uh, trying uh, to put some preamble uh, in saying, um, uh, of course, being an economist, uh, uh, we, are, we are trying to focus on the things of competitiveness. We are trying to find out how the nations can be competitive, how the companies can be co competitive, how the individual can be competitive. And obviously it puts uh, the human capital up front and the countries differ dependent upon how they are treating the human capital. And then of course the buzzword today is creativity and innovation. Um, and I think almost there is no doubt 
that this is the buzz magic word, the Higgs on bo boson, right? That is the one that is bringing the difference among the nations. And then we are coming to the reality. And the reality is that there is much of rhetorics, and then the reality is very different. Rhetorics is saying, we heard also this morning, of course, from the Prime Minister in a nice speech, um, everything is in, you know, developing, we are having from the kindergarten up to whatever, and then we are facing reality. And the reality is, of course, pretty much tough, in particular in the countries that are having some lines of um, uh, developing education in some good formats, but on the other hand, actually losing, losing the ground once uh, competing with what's going on around the world. And what is in the world is actually the only certainty is uncertainty. That's the only certainty in today's world. And if we are coping the uncertainty with having the only single answers, correct answers in our schooling system, then we are wrong. And if we would interview today in our schooling system, how many teachers are actually expecting, both from the elementary school up to the universities, still asking students to confirm the teacher's knowledge, that's, that's we are far from the reality. And this is, I think, one of the things that we are facing, and today there is some acronym being used in the business called VUCA. VUCA is the acronym saying that we are living in the world of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, and in this world, we have to do really, uh, 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 Gary said this morning, we are not doing enough. Because we are facing the issues, of course, how in the future we're gonna, uh, we're gonna close the skills gap, how in the future uh, we're gonna do some things, having in mind that if uh, uh, in the basics of microeconomics is saying that if you are doing partial reforms, you can do even worse. So, you know, knowing those things uh, is the question what, what we have to do. So, um, I want to say um, very quickly about this changing world, about the challenges of enacting creativity, about the factors that are inhibiting uh, creativity, and then some maybe actions uh, about that. Um, today, challenges, of course, uh, of learning is uh, um, getting really harder for the next generations. We, we don't have a prediction how the tomorrow will look like. We are guessing, we are trying to understand, and um, and uh, uh, today somebody said, uh, I think maybe even you, Carl, said, or wh whoever, that actually teaching subjects is old-fashioned. Um, and that actually the, the education has to go toward phenomenon-based learning. That, of course, there are countries starting there, like Finland, Scandinavian countries, some others, that are trying to make this shift. Um, the, uh, Nora said, content must be brought and linked to the real life of students. It has to be. The students have to have this opportunity to, to have the education that is uh, uh, making this liaison with the, with the real life. Certainty must be avoided. I remember being a student, you know, at the time that um, uh, my professors, <laughs> my professor, long time ago, my professors uh, were asking me, you know, uh, list me the factors that are relevant for something. And I was supposed to list 15 factors in order to satisfy the the, the, the professor's uh, requirements. I'm sure it's not still abundant. And, um, you know, uh, there is one saying, you know, if, if the things uh, could be learned uh, throughout the books, if entrepreneurship can, uh, could be learned on a book, all of us would be entrepreneurs. So it's also the question, can we teach creativity? There is no manual for creativity. And then it's the question, are we lacking creative teachers or creative learners? Where we are? Uh, Tanya was talking about Generation Z, Y, whichever. So there is a concept of so-called mass education to be embraced. So not a single answer, but to have really the world being, being indication and really to allow students to think outside of the box. There are, there are uh, a number of definitions of cre creativity. And I think it's worth saying what do we think it's creativity because of its definition we are starting with a problem. Problem with the policymakers that cannot make the guidelines, what is the creativity in education, and then the teachers, they don't know how to enact the creativity because they are lacking the guidelines from, from the policymakers. Uh, one that I like that is maybe not that um, uh, workable for this uh, um, session is uh, uh, from Albert Einstein. 
Uh, everybody likes to quote somebody, so I found Albert Einstein. It's not bad. Uh, um, so creativity is seeing uh, what everyone else has seen and thinking what no one else has thought. You know, I, I, I love that one. But for the sake of what we need, I'll use that creativity thinking is um, thinking that enables students to apply their imagination to generating ideas, questions, hypotheses, experimenting with alternatives, and evaluating their own and their peers' ideas, final products, and processes. And there are a lot of people here that are in the academic world. And it's a question for us. How much our students are put in those situations? How much we, as their teachers, are giving them the space, time, actions, playing the world in which they are really out of the box? putting their imagination. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid we are not doing, doing again much. Um, and then, once we are talking about components of creativity, of course, and that is what uh, today a rector of Belgrade University said, uh, asked on the question, uh, how about the uh, formal degrees? And I think she rightly said that we need to have, to be creative, you have to have individual knowledge. You have to have an expertise. That's why you need at least bachelor being in a formal degree type of, of knowledge. We are talking about creative thinking skills, and of course, I think what, what is probably lacking in a traditional world is the question of motivation. Motivation is really the true energy source of any human endeavor, and in that sense, you know, obviously, it's one of the underlying uh, uh, stuff for, for the creativity. Challenges quickly, I said definition. Definition shows its uh, multifaceted nature. It shows its ill-structured position because it's emergent, contextual, I would say complex, and in such a way it doesn't give enough room for policy makers to shape it in a proper way. And that's why there is like an interregnum in which there are no clear guidelines, maybe it shouldn't be, it's also a question, but how the policy makers take in education, how they shape this type of creativity, and on the other hand, we ended up with the teachers that are somewhere in a gloomy phase in which not having uh, understanding from the policy guidelines what is how to bring creativity and then leaving actually uh, trying to fulfill uh, the complex curriculum that is in front of them and trying to uh, 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 fulfill the format. Not the substance, but the format. And we can talk about that if you want. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, one of the biggest questions is probably that is uh, pre-existing traditions and culture. It's probably one of the biggest difficulties how to come from the point A to point B. Point B is playground, point A is traditional cultural norms that exist still in the countries like Serbia or whatever. Main factors quickly, as, as it can be maybe summarized from what I already said, it's prescriptive environment of the school, mostly. Curriculum oriented towards quantity rather than quality. Even, even I would mention, um, this, this lack of um, uh, consensus regarding the understanding the model of mental processes associated with creativity. You know, now we are coming to the question of philosophers and these, the other scientists that are needed in order really to bring us this understanding of this mental process behind. It's not just plug and play. There are so many important, relevant issues in education that have to be explained and understood in order to make the proper way forward. Um, is there enough uh, training for teachers to foster creativity of students, although the most of them uh, are claiming that they encourage students to be creative, but they don't respond? So, we don't have creative learners. Is it the issue or is it the teachers that should be enacting in a more way the creativity? And then we are coming to IT, of course, technology, use of instruments maybe to assess the creativity, to support teaching from creativity, whatever. And then the last one, it's some of the actions. Uh, first one is, I would say, systemic. We have to abandon the paradigm of a school being a factory. School is not a factory. It's not fast food fa uh, uh, company. It's uh, uh, the situation in which the education doesn't need to be reformed, but transformed. And the key is, again, uh, I think we are living in the world there is much of standardization of education instead of personalizing. Uh, uh, because that would bring us toward uh, discovering the individual talents of each child. And 
if we are having factors that inhibit creativity, then of course the first uh, action is to uh, work in uh, eliminating those factors, starting from those mental processes up to reform of curriculum, up to the status of the teachers, and the number of things that every country is having, I'm, I'm sure, as an issue uh, that are blocking the, the, the stronger development on this side. Um, There are a number of methods. One way is bringing the playground. There are methods uh, that everybody can find from Pestalozzi method to Montessori. I have listed a number of things that you can find that are encouraging the creativity. The teachers have to go to this continuous professional development in order really to be taught how to enact the creativity, to um, ask open-ended questions, to um, establish discussion routines, to use visible thinking, to use design thinking. So there, there are so many things being developed in the recent past that can definitely help if, if at the end would bring us to the level where we're gonna have enough creative teachers that will bring us to the situation to be really satisfied that uh, the new generation will have the benefit of that. And uh, um, I would say, um, at the end, um, but on the question, can you teach creativity? Um, um, obviously, it's not a skill that you can grasp uh, or, or properly define. But of course, there are, I would say, um, uh, skills toolkit that you can help in developing, enacting the things that exist in every child, in every person. And of course, uh, I would say, uh, uh, that is why country, uh, uh, countries differ around the world, is the question, are you capable of fostering the right culture or not? If you are, as a, as a, as a country, as a society, as an uh, as a education, as an institution, Samba said, uh, if you are bringing the right culture, what does it really mean fostering uh, the creativity and innovation and thinking out of the box? It's not implementation of IT tools only. It's not uh, making only good curriculums. It's really the big shift, the big change. Uh, that is how, actually, then, then we may end up uh, at the end in closing the gap in between rhetoric uh, uh, positioning ourselves saying how important it is to have creativity and innovation instead of having actually uh, the reality being much closer to this uh, rhetoric. Thank you. Thank you very much.